Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. This interview is airing on Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Uh, you go back some distance with uh, Canada Day on Parliament Hill. <laughs> uh, you lived here until you were 14. Yeah. Do you have any uh, memories of, of uh, Canada Day's gone by? Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there was always the, the, the noon shows, but I don't remember any of those. What I remember more specifically was wandering with my dad through Confederation Park, through Majors Hill Park, uh, on the hill, looking at all the different exhibits. I remember there were trampolines set up. We got to jump on trampolines. I tried fencing for the first time with Canada's fencing team. Uh, they were just, it was just an opportunity to wander with my dad uh, and my brothers, you know, through throngs of happy people with maple leaves on their, on their, on their cheeks. Uh, and then uh, inevitably we got to watch the fireworks from my dad's window at 24 Sussex because we never got to be out that late. Okay. There's a great old photo of you and your brothers uh, on the lawn, I, I believe, of Parliament Hill watching the celebrations with your dad. You've now been Prime Minister long enough to have a sense of what it's like as a, as a, as a Prime Minister who's a father in Ottawa. Is it different for your kids than it was for you and your brothers? Um, I think, sure, there are differences. I mean, social media, selfies, the, the kind of, of attention that one gets, but the substance isn't that different. I mean, the, you know, figuring out how to raise kids who are grounded, uh, despite the fact that they live pretty lucky and extraordinary yeah, lives yeah, where yeah, yeah, they get to meet presidents and kings and queens and, and have them be able to be normal kids with a normal family life, uh, play basketball with them after school, help them with their homework, uh, you know, go for uh, hikes that they don't want to go on in the weekend as a family. These, these kinds of experiences shaped my life much more than everything else, all the fanciness in the crowds, and certainly I hope that that's what's shaping their lives. Okay. What are you celebrating this Canada Day? There's so much going on, but what, is, what does it mean to you this year? Um, I mean, it's strange because celebrating Canada 150 is almost by definition looking back over 150 years. We look at all this way we've come over 150 years, but that's not the way I think. I mean, yes, there's a lot to be proud of in the past, but I try to very much be focused on the future. So, I mean, the four themes we picked this year, you know, diversity and inclusion, youth, environment and reconciliation with indigenous peoples. These are all very much present and future emphases. So how we move forward on these issues, how we imagine what the next 150 years could be is what I'm very much focused on. Okay. You mentioned reconciliation with, reconciliation with indigenous people. You must be aware that there are a lot of people who say there's nothing to celebrate uh, this Canada Day. We see uh, roadside signs that say Canada 150, Mi'kmaq 13,000, and uh, newspaper articles that say uh, Canada Day is a celebration of indigenous genocide. What do you say to people who say there's nothing to celebrate on this day? Oh, I think, I think there's obviously uh, different experiences over the past 150 years for, for a lot of people. And Canada has some very, very dark histories from uh, internments to turning away the St. Louis and the Kumagata Maru, but none is darker uh, than our abject failure to respect rights, the, the spirit and intent of the original treaties uh, with uh, First Nations, Métis Nation and Inuit peoples. Uh, we have to transform that relationship and there's a lot of people who uh, are rightly skeptical because uh, over generations despite all the you know good intentions from time to time terrible things have happened so uh, I go into this very very open-eyed and aware of the kind of work we need to do and quite frankly the work that's going to stretch over generations if we're talking of centuries worth of of, of a problem of, of terrible things uh, then uh, we're going to have to talk about generations to fix it and to and to work together towards it and we've done some significant concrete things but there's a lot more to do um, by now I'm sure you're getting a chance to take the measure of the of the challenge uh, before the election in 2015, you promised to uh, uh, eliminate uh, long-term uh, boil water, water. Yeah, boil water advisories on on, uh, on reservations and in indigenous communities. There were 133 such advisories when you made that promise. There's 135 now. 
Is it harder than you, than, it, than you thought it would be? We always knew it was going to be a hard challenge. That's why, quite frankly, we gave ourselves five years. Because getting, uh, fixing boil water advisories uh, are of themselves a, an important challenge, but they're also indicators of huge structural, governance, investment, infrastructure problems that need to be fixed. So if you can fix boil water advisories, you're also going a long way towards uh, fixing a whole bunch of other things that are challenges. So it's, it's both a challenge of itself and an indicator of other things going well. Uh, we're working very hard. We've taken a number of communities off and in a long-term way as well, because that's what you really need. You, you don't want want people to you know, sort of fix it now and have them fall back into challenges in, in a year and making sure we're making the right long-term investments. Uh, it's taking a little while, but it's because we need to get to a place where once we do it, uh, they're done and we're still very much on track to meet our, our five-year deadline. Okay. Um, more broadly, I think the challenge that any government faces as it nears sort of the halfway point in its mandate is the challenge of living up to the expectations uh, and the hopes that attended uh, its election. Um, if I was a young progressive voter in Vancouver, three things I'm not, uh, uh, and I had voted liberal in 2015 hoping I'd have a government that would relax the rules around pot, block pipelines, and deliver real democratic reform, I would be wondering what happened to those liberals by now. Um, are, do you worry about the weight of expectations and the weight of the disappointment that, that attends it? Uh, I've actually been extremely consistent with uh, what we promised and what we've, what we've uh, committed to doing. Uh, on marijuana, it was never around relaxing the rules. It was always about controlling and regulating the sale of marijuana to better protect our kids from having the easy access they have now. Uh, and to take the billions of dollars of profits out of the pockets of criminal and actually criminals and actually uh, put them uh, to, to, to use in our system, whether it's in our, our medical system or health care or, or just uh, creating uh, tax revenue and, and business opportunities, whatever it is, take it out of the hands of criminals. So that's why we're doing that and we're doing it right and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be done. Um, on the issue of, of pipelines, I always said we're going to protect the environment and we're going to build the economy. We're going to do them both at the same time. And, and people are looking at the historic investments in an ocean protections plan for the BC coast, uh, the pan-Canadian framework on climate change where we're actually going to reach our climate targets. We're bringing in a national price on carbon and uh, part of the way we're able to do that is we're moving forward uh, on growing the economy in smart ways. Uh, and we did approve uh, a few pipelines and, and say no to some others and we're doing it in a responsible way. I want to talk a little bit about the economy. The housing market, of course, is so hot now in Toronto and Vancouver and some other parts of the country, but especially there. Um, are you worried that a correction to that housing market could, bring the, could drag the whole economy down? And is this really something that the federal government has n no uh, possible levers over, no impact over? We do have levers and we've used some. The, the uh, finance minister move forward on some rules around mortgages that uh, have made a significant difference. Uh, we're also moving forward for the first time in, in well over 10 years uh, on a national housing strategy. You know, the federal government is uh, investing, uh, you know, 11, 11 and a half billion dollars uh, in uh, housing, particularly low income and affordable housing, which is going to make a difference in those markets. Uh, we also have done the kinds of things in terms of putting more money in the pockets of the middle class that make a difference. We lowered taxes on the middle class. We raised them on the wealthiest 1%. Uh, we delivered a Canada Child Benefit that helps 9 out of 10 Canadian families tax-free every month uh, with more money than they had before and is going to lift hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty. So these are things that are happening on a, on a, on a direct level that is going to have an impact on people. Uh, yes, uh, there are concerns about uh, the housing markets in, in, in Vancouver and in Toronto and, and elsewhere. Uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, the economy is growing with good jobs, with good opportunities, with money in the pockets so people can feel confident about being able to afford their homes uh, regardless of what the housing market does. Okay. Your government is moving heaven and earth to get highly talented, uh, highly mobile young knowledge workers to move to Canada. They would likely move uh, to Vancouver and to Toronto. Is it an obstacle for them that those are such uh, 
expensive cities to live in. Uh, you know, one of the great things about Canada is we're seeing development of uh, hubs of really innovative success uh, right across the country from Kitchener and Waterloo to Montreal to uh, uh, the west end of Ottawa to great work being done in Edmonton and in, 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 uh, in Calgary, elsewhere. Uh, there is a real interest in the kind of youth entrepreneurship and the opportunities to be part of the digital uh, and the global economy uh, in Canada and we're, we're taking, uh, uh, you know, taking a lot of people uh, with, with interest in, in being successful. I mean, we're getting companies to uh, invest in Canada, to expand their workforces, to do more R&D. We've had big news around uh, AI and other things. I think people are looking at Canada and realizing we're a place uh, that is building for the long term and for where the world's going to be. Okay. Some other countries are being way more overt in their pitch that what they're trying to do is to get people who might have wanted to set up shop in the United States to move because they're disappointed with the, the American regime. Your new friend Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, has whole websites saying, look, if you're sick of the United States, come here. Are you uh, tempted by a more uh, overt marketing strategy like that or not? Uh, you know, I don't, think, I don't think we need to go the whole overt way about it because we're doing a great job building the kind of relationships uh, in Silicon Valley, in New York, uh, you know, throughout the United States that says, uh, hey, we're doing great things here in Canada. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley already recruits more people from University of Waterloo than any other institution in the world. Uh, there are more and more startups and companies that are uh, that are staying. They're getting money from elsewhere, from Silicon Valley, and staying and creating success here in Canada. So uh, we're just going to continue doing what we do: is demonstrate the ease of doing business in Canada, the access to capital, uh, the the capacity that we have to bring in uh, you know qualified talent uh, to create more jobs for Canadians, uh, and the great quality of life that we have. I mean, there's a there's a great story, and we're telling it. Uh, not in a, an aggressive way, but in a very clear way around the world. A lot of this involves you personally acting as the pitch man for Canada, going to meet with the head of the Qatar Development Agency from the Middle East, going down to Texas and meeting with CEOs from the big, the big uh, tech and industrial firms. Are you spending, first of all, do you think the Canadians really understand why you're hobnobbing with billionaires as much as you are? And secondly, are you, do you find that you're spending more time as a pitchman than you would have uh, expected? Uh, you know, I think Canada has a great story and I'm glad to tell it and if there's a moment where the world is paying a little more attention to Canada, well, I think it's important to try and capitalize on that and we've had uh, great successes, whether it's Thomson Reuters uh, moving their global headquarters uh, back back home to, uh, to the GTA, uh, whether it's Microsoft making significant investments in Vancouver, uh, whether it's uh, uh, GE opening up an engine plant in Welland in the Niagara Peninsula, we have, we have great stories of companies realizing that Canada is a great place to invest uh, because of Canadians themselves, because of a forward-thinking, hard-working, uh, you know, well-educated workforce. This is what the world's looking at, and the diversity that we can showcase uh, is a huge draw for people. So uh, I'm glad to be, to be highlighting that, uh, but uh, I'm also working very, very hard here at home to deliver on the kinds of things that Canadians expect. We, uh, we announced recently uh, massive investments in, in public transit in Ottawa, in Montreal, all elsewhere. These are infrastructure dollars that are going to create good money, good jobs now and growth and quality of life uh, for, for a generation. That's what Canadians expect from this government. I've, I've heard it said that there's more work coming on, on addressing the sense of fairness that people uh, are, are seeking in the economy, that, that uh, the well-off pay uh, their fair share. Uh, there's some talk of tax measures coming in the fall that would make it clearer that the rich have to have to pay their fair share. Is that something that we can look forward to? It, the very first thing we did when we came into office was lower taxes on the middle class and raise them on the wealthiest 1%. And we've said that throughout, that that's, that's the lens at which we look at taxes and fairness on. We're going to lower taxes on the middle class uh, and find ways uh, to make it fair and raise them on, on the wealthy people. We've had, we've had a, a long stretch of low growth for our economy uh, and people feel that uh, you know, the hard work they've done just hasn't given them the kind of opportunities or confidence that it has for the 1% or even the 0.1%. We need to make sure that everyone's pulling their weight and doing their fair share. And, and uh, Canadians get that, including the wealthy Canadians I talk to, understand that we're 
all better off when everyone has a real and fair chance to succeed. Okay, so more new measures along that li those we're, lines? We're looking in to make sure things are fair, and we're always looking at ways to lower taxes for the middle class and raise them on the wealthiest 1%. Okay. One of your ministers, Christian Freeland, the foreign minister, got an awful lot of attention for a speech she gave in the House of Commons about 10 days, well, some time ago now, and uh, in which she said that Canada has to follow its own clear, sovereign course. That was read especially by a lot of American commentators as too bad, so sad, the United States. We got along for, uh, for 150 years, but now we have to make our own way in the world. Were people reading appropriately into that one line or, or, or not? I, I, I don't see that it's a, a, a that much of a difference from what Canada has always done. We've always had our own uh, position, our own course in, in the world, whether it was uh, engaging with Cuba, whether it was uh, you know, looking for differences in our foreign policy with the United States. I mean, the fact is we're always uh, going to be uh, interwoven with the American economy, and that's why it's important to have a good, strong, constructive relationship with whoever uh, uh, the American president is and whatever administration it is, whatever their priorities, we will always work constructively together, but at the same time, Canadians expect us uh, to stand up for our own values, to make our own choices, whether it's around climate or uh, multilateral institutions, and that's exactly what we're going to keep doing. Okay. There's a lot of pressure and a lot of expectation that the uh, uh, young Prime Minister of Canada will lead the resistance against the Trump administration, the global resistance against Trump, and I get the impression that's actually just about the last thing you'd like to do, because Canadians are also saying, don't screw up Canadian jobs that depend on trade with the United States. Is that, uh, how is that balancing act going? I, I think I'm, I'm very much a reflection of what uh, Canadians have told me, not just over the past year and a half, but over the past years, uh, the past decades of, of my childhood, of, of having been a, a teacher across the country, having met and chatted with Canadians of, of every possible background. People don't expect us to lecture or hector or try and shake our fist at the world. Uh, they want us to work hard, succeed, and be a good example uh, on things that we figured out. So whether it's uh, you know figuring out how to, to make a strong country, uh, a country stronger uh, based on diversity rather than looking at weaknesses through differences, uh, whether it's about being open to trade and knowing that that can create good jobs for people, uh, or whether it's charting an independent course uh, in, in how we engage with the world, this is what Canadians expect. And you know, there's, no, there's no sense at all oh, we have to go and, and, and pick fights around the world. It's much more of how can we help, how can we be productive and constructive. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. In this context, as you seek uh, free trade potentially with China, and as your trade minister is spending a lot of time in the Pacific region, is this purely a trade-related thing? Is it simply that the China is so big and, and, and such a fast-growing economy that we got to be uh, in on that? Or is there a strategic interest too? Is there a sense that China is rising in the world and might supplant older powers as a new power in the world? I think I think Canadians expect us to take advantage of geography. I mean, Canada has always been uh, lucky enough to have access to the U.S. market through the longest uh, undefended border in the world. We have traditional ties uh, back to uh, to uh, to, uh, to Europe that have been strengthened with the Canada uh, Europe uh, uh, free trade deal, uh, and uh, we know that there's a lot of opportunity in rising economies uh, in the east, uh, it's across the Pacific. So uh, whether it's looking for new markets for our agricultural products or uh, partnerships in, in manufacturing or opportunities for Canadians to succeed, uh, we're absolutely looking at China and India and, and deepening our ties with Japan and, and the growing economies there because you know, Canada is such a successful reflection of every corner of the world and our people. It just makes sense for us to uh, be engaging constructively and productively everywhere we can. Okay. I think we've almost covered the world in this short uh, period of time, so I'll stop there. Thanks once again for joining us. I appreciate it. What a pleasure, Paul.